we have to remember at the very beginning. Here, when we encounter is it related to us and what is its final importance history of philosophy has been a long record of varieties of definitions and answers to this great question endless definitions have been provided by various thinkers and philosophers throughout history of thought one of the insurmountable difficulty that you may face in this connection is the habituated feeling that consciousness is inside the body you can never forget that this is the fact where is your consciousness it is inside me it cannot be anywhere else of course you are prepared to concede that consciousness is inside everybody else also <clears throat> but that does not help the matter though you do agree that consciousness is inside every person that it is inside a person is very important to remember when you say it is inside what actually do you mean by this idea water is inside a bucket fruits are inside a basket we are all inside a room do you mean that consciousness is inside us in this sense because that which is inside in the example cited is totally different from that in which it is located the fruits are not the basket the people are not the room and so on and so forth going along this analogy it would mean that consciousness is not the body <clears throat> because you say it is inside the body or are you prepared to say that it is the body itself if you say that perhaps consciousness is not inside in the sense explained <clears throat> it is inseparable from the body inseparableness also involves a kind of relation <coughs> two brothers in a family may be inseparable as partners in a business husband and wife may be inseparable socially speaking but in spite of the fact that they are inseparable they are not one person they are not identical so in view of this problem you will find that <coughs> easily you cannot decipher the location of consciousness <coughs> when you think you will agree that it is consciousness that is responsible for thinking who is thinking is it your body that is thinking or is there something else that you think is thinking you will as an intelligent educated person <coughs> may not agree that the body is thinking because when you say a person is coming 
we do not mean that the a body is coming we mean something else in our concept of a person coming for instance i shall speak to you when you say or make statements like this who exactly is making this statement is this body speaking any application of common sense will not permit the idea that body is speaking who is speaking when you speak i am speaking what do you mean by this i am speaking who are you you will scratch your head 100 times but cannot come to a definite conclusion it has been held by certain thinkers who are affiliated to a materialist doctrine that there is a certain an avoidable relationship between body and consciousness because body also is conscious when you prick the body with a needle you will know that the body is pricked if the consciousness is not vitally related to the body inextricably as it were or rather organically so to speak consciousness cannot feel the prick here one may feel that you cannot separate consciousness from the body the doctrine known as epiphenomenalism or the theory that consciousness is a function of the organism of a person lead to the conclusion has led to the conclusion that consciousness is perhaps an emanation from the bodily individuality of a person as fire emanates from a matchstick it is an exudation an emanation a kind of product arising as a effect of the physical organism and this is the reason why no one can feel that oneself is a consciousness there is always an insistent feeling that oneself is a body only any kind of theoretical argument against this assumption does not cut ties there is a intense fondness for the body of a person it is taken care of as is identical with one's own self it is me and i cannot be different from what i appear to be if on this assumption we go back to our question as to where consciousness is located we would not be able to give a correct and final answer if it is true that consciousness for the purpose of our present argument is accepted to be inside the body only whatever be its relation to the body it cannot be outside the world it was pointed out by me last time that if the consciousness is only inside the body there would be no means of its knowing that there are things outside the body it is this 
peculiar situation of it being necessary for consciousness to know that there are things outside it also it is this feeling that takes us beyond the original concept of the inwardness of consciousness as located in the body there seems to be something very strange about its operation not as it appears to be for all ordinary common sense thinking how do you know that there is an object outside you there have been various theories realistic and idealistic and various other approaches which tell us how we come to know that there is an object outside us often it is said that the objects as they are are never known by us the objects are known by us only as they appear to our mind or consciousness this is to say that we have a descriptive knowledge of the behavior of objects but do not we do not come directly in contact with the objects as they are in themselves difference has been noticed between what people call the primary qualities of an object and its secondary qualities the secondary qualities are the descriptive characteristics by which we apprehend the nature of an object that is to say the way in which an object reacts to the sense organs that way is the secondary quality but the reaction of an object upon the senses cannot be necessarily considered as the nature of the object itself something may produce a reaction for reasons other than what the thing itself is so the nature of a reaction cannot be the definition of the object as it is the true nature of the object is supposed to be constituted of what are known as primary qualities here we have another problem which has been pointed out vigorously by idealistic thinkers if only the secondary qualities are available for cognition to the sense organs and the mind and the intellect only play second fiddle to the operations of the senses how do you come to know that there are things called primary qualities in other words how do you know that things exist at all except in the sense of a reaction produced by them in a representative manner not as a direct contact with the object there is no means it is said of really coming in contact with the essence of an object here we come to the great prescription of a sutra in the system of patanjali who accepts this distinction of the primary qualities or essence of an object as it is and the object as it appears to us in deep meditation which is the principal subject of yoga 
we seem to be coming in contact with the object of meditation in some way but in what way do you come in contact with the object of meditation the sutra of patanjali is very definite in its conclusion that what we know as an object is only a mixture of certain characteristics foisted upon the object by our perceptual or cognitional faculties what does this mean you cannot decipher a particular object unless it has a nomenclature a name for instance only if a object is designated by a particular description called name you can know what that object is this is one point the second point is apart from the name or the verbal description of an object that is necessary in order that we may locate the object there is also we in our mind an idea of what the object is we cannot know the object except in the manner in which we are able to entertain an idea about the object we have an idea that a tree is tall you cannot believe that tree is flat or it is only a stub and in a similar manner we have a particular idea of every other thing in the world the yoga system points out that our idea of the object cannot be regarded as ultimately a correct description of the object because it is already stated that the so called object of which you have an idea is known only through descriptive characteristics according to the capacity of the sense organs to cognize or perceive the object there is therefore the mental quality foisted upon the object on one hand the name or designation verbally is also is another aspect which is foisted upon the object but what is the object by itself here we go to the fundamental metaphysics of yoga for all practical purposes <coughs> we may take it for granted that the philosophy of the sankhya <coughs> with much of which the vedanta also agrees is the basis of the yoga doctrine yoga is the practical application of the deduction arrived at through the philosophical investigations of the sankhya which in basic principles does not differ much from the vedanta <coughs> the sankhya is a word which means actually a method of enumeration of the categories of reality if you have to understand what are these categories i can only give you an illustration by common example there is an object called a hard stone or a granite <coughs> you take 
were granted that the granite is exactly as it appears to the sense organs. But by investigation you can know that the so-called hard impenetrable object called the granite is constituted of little little particles. You can break the stone into minute elements so small that you may not be able to visualize them with your naked eye. Such invisible constituents you call the particles of matter seem to constitute the visible object you call the solid stone. Invisible constituents become visible objects. These particles can be divided further into minuter and minuter components. until they become indistinguishable from the basic components of all things in the world. Material or non-material things in general have basically a uniform characteristic of material constitution and they tend to become ubiquitous in their nature at the end so that the fundamental essence of the objects seems to be a uniformly distributed essence and this essence being the basic reality of the so-called varieties of things makes us conclude that there is a unity at the back of the apprehended duality and multiplicity of objects. The stages by which you dissect an object and enter into its basic components are actually the categories of the Sankhya, which leads finally to a principle which is further not capable of dissection. You can dissect or reduce to basic components a thing that is distinguishable from another object. That which is indistinguishable cannot be so subjected to dissection or further analysis. There is a point where all analysis ceases. That point is the all-pervading nature of the fundamental essence of the objects. The Sankhya calls this fundamental ubiquitous material essence as Prakriti. The word Prakriti, though it appears very vigorously in the Sankhya philosophy, appears also in Vedantic scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Manusmriti, etc. They differ in certain matters which are not our concern at the present moment. This all-pervading universal, basic, indistinguishable essence of material existence is Prakriti. It is the ultimate objectivity of all things. It is 
best described as objectivity and not an object objectivity is a characteristic and object is a thing as we conceive it in as much as our body which is material in its nature also is subject to reduction to its fundamentals in the manner we do other objects it may mean that we as physical existence so called are also inseparable in our basic material essence from this ubiquitous prakriti so that we cannot stand outside prakriti as physical embodiments now in as much as this all pervading physical essence which is called prakriti or the matrix of all things includes even the individualizing physical part of even the observer of all things we may have to consider here an observer of this material content is not so individualized as it appears in common sense perception of objects by our so called individuality because here in the reduction of all materials into this fundamental material all pervading essence our so called individual bodily essence necessary for perception externally also gets melted down into this all pervading material essence then who becomes conscious that there is a prakriti it is not possible that any individualized center of consciousness can apprehend this all pervasive material content that which apprehends an all pervading thing cannot be finitely located somewhere because finitude contradicts the all pervadingness of the object hence the sankhya concludes by the very force of logic that the knower of this ubiquitous material essence should also be ubiquitous that is to say the knowing consciousness cannot be located in any particular center because if that has been the case there will be nobody to know that there is a universal material content today in modern physics for instance we are told that everything is cosmic universal energy space time continuum etc how does anyone comprehend this all pervading ubiquitous space time complex that comprehending principle which is the consciousness cannot be located in one place only and then conclude that there thing that is known is all pervading that would be a logical contradiction so the sankhya is forced to accept a knower who is equal in its capacity to the nature of the object known as prakriti that is to say the consciousness that knows this fundamental material all pervading substance should also be all pervading this consciousness that apprehends this universal material essence is called purusha which should not be identified with man or a human essence it is a metaphysical definition given to the consciousness which is supposed to know that there is a universally distributed material essence consciousness as you know cannot be identified with matter there is a total dissimilarity between consciousness and matter matter does not know itself 
consciousness knows itself. This is the distinction between objectivity and pure subjectivity. This subjectivity, so called, is also, as you have to remember, is a universally spread of unlimited consciousness. So, according to the Sankhya, Purusha is infinite, all pervading, and the pragati that is known by it also is all pervading. Though this position is very helpful to us in our practice of meditation, on a final logical analysis of the situation, you will observe a contradiction because two infinites cannot exist. You cannot have one infinite of consciousness knowing and another infinite of material ubiquitousness. This is, as the Vedanta would point out, the defect of Sankhya doctrine. If you are able to overlook this metaphysical defect of the basic deductions of the Sankhya as pointed out and do not concern yourself with this problem metaphysically, you will have a practical guidance coming to you from this system of the categorization of the evolution of the prakriti into material form which will be described to you gradually. This Purusha, which is all-pervading, comes in contact with this ubiquitous material substance in some way. And you have only to say some way because exactly in what way it comes in contact, you cannot know. The usual example given by the Sankhya philosophy is that consciousness does not really come in contact with this material object because they are dissimilar in nature. What happens is the consciousness reflects within itself the presence of this ubiquitous material substance as a crystal which is pure in itself and has no color by itself can reflect the color of an object such as a rose flower for instance brought near it and because of the proximity of this colored object the whole crystal may also look red. In this manner the Sankhya explains that consciousness wrongly you must say begins to associate itself, itself with the objects in the world and the basic prakriti universal matrix of things originally and creates a wondrous universal situation. That objectified consciousness which has arisen on account of this reflection of the ubiquitous material substance on the all pervading consciousness, that situation is the ultimate metaphysical reality of the Sankhya called cosmic being, which knows itself as all pervading. It knows itself as all pervading by coming in contact with this all-pervading ubiquitous substance of material essence by getting reflected in itself. Otherwise, the omnipotence or omnipresence or omniscience of this all-knowing consciousness cannot be explained because in order that something may be omnipresent, there must be 
a field of ubiquitousness in which it operates as all pervading or crudely to put it unless there is space there cannot be the question of omnipresence presence everywhere that is meaning of omnipresence the idea of everywhereness arises on account of the presence of space because there is no such thing as everywhere minus the idea of space all knowing things it is omniscient knowing all things means the all things must exist in order that this omniscience may be possible so is omnipotence all power all power means the capacity to exert its authority on things which are other than itself it cannot exert authority on itself only this is a conceptual categorization of the original manifestation of objectivity according to the sankhya philosophy it calls this condition mahatatva the great knowing logos as religions would tell you it is the original intelligence which knows all things this idea of all things omniscience omnipotence arises on account of this so called association of the otherwise infinitude of consciousness with this material ubiquitous substance this sankhya goes down further below to the point where we are living now by bringing into its operation another principle namely the self assertive character of this omniscient omnipotent being it is to be known clearly that there is a distinction between just bare featureless all pervadingness of the principle of omniscience and the self consciousness attached associated with this all pervading essence the omnipresent being should know that it is omnipresent otherwise it will be just be being as such this this is a particular descent from the original stage of pure omnipresence or omniscience wherein there is a universal self consciousness of the fact of being omnipresent i am is the feeling of this omnipresent being it is not the i of myself and yourself it is a universal omnipotence and omnipresence asserting itself i am religion tells us that god is great i am i am what i am or i am that i am god cannot be described by any other way that he is and god can regard himself as i am there is no other possible definition available to this great i which includes every other conceivable little dots of eyes like ourselves this self consciousness attributed to this otherwise all pervading omnipresence suddenly manifest itself in a threefold form <coughs> that threefold form is known in vedantic language as the objective reality called adibhuta the subjective reality called adhyatma and the divine superintending connection between the subjective side and the objective side known as adhi daiva here we are coming into certain very very important practical issues 
in our daily attempt to enter into yoga meditation the world appears to be external to the knowing consciousness and the knowing consciousness places itself as a subjective knower of this world that is outside and for reasons well known as has been already explained this connection between the subjective knower and the objective world cannot be established unless there is a link between the subjective side and the objective side to which i have made <coughs> elaborate reference on the first day itself this is the reason why you cannot know what is happening between you and the object when perception takes place some invisible operation which is consciousness by itself seems to be operating because the link between the knowing subject and the object cannot but be conscious we need not go further into the subject because i have already touched upon it the other day now something happens by way of a further evolution from the adhibhuta or objective side from the adhyatma or the subjective side and adhidaiva or the superintending conscious principle side this is a very important subject which requires a detailed explanation so that you may understand what it means and how it is relevant to your yoga practice this matter i shall take up another time hari om tasmay